Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Today, we'll be, we will continue our, uh, to take a closer look at the relationship between agriculture and water quality in Ireland. And we're joined by Dr. Karen Daly, Senior Research Officer based in Chagas Johnstown Castle. Uh, we're also joined by Andy Boland, uh, Environment Specialist with Chagas. Uh, Andy, you're going to be helping us with the questions today. Morning, Mark. Morning, Morning Andy. Andy. Um, Morning, Andy. Now, today, uh, Karen, we're going to be looking, I suppose, at the science uh, behind uh, phosphorus and, and, and its interaction with water and soil. So uh, it's really important that we, we understand that before we can uh, move to start putting together mitigation measures. Yeah, absolutely. So once we understand what's going on in the ground and the interaction between phosphorus and uh, water that might come through the ground, and where it all happens <clears throat> in the farm, on the farm, around the catchment, then we can start to have a conversation about what's the right measure and the right measure in the right place. So it, the more information we have about phosphorus and its behavior in soils and its interaction with water in the wider environment, the better equipped we are then to mitigate any losses and make sure that we're farming sustainably with regard to phosphorus. Great. So uh, we have a, a diverse audience joining us this morning, Karen. So uh, we, we'll, we'll try and break down the science as much as we can. Um, and uh, I, I know you've uh, tried to limit the number of graphs in your, your presentation Yeah, absolutely. As well. I'm, I'm going to, um, the first half of this talk will be um, um, a little bit of uh, the science behind phosphorus and its dynamics in soils. And then the second half, I'm going to show you some case studies of um, farms where we've tried to sort of look at what, where the pinch points might be. And the pinch points might be where you'll have a phosphorus source coinciding with a, a pathway. And then for any catchment scientists out there in the audience, they might have a guess at what measure and where they might place on my case study farms. So I'm looking forward to hearing some input and feedback from, from those members of the audience this morning. Okay, so this morning it's all about phosphorus. Last week it was all about nitrogen, but today phosphorus gets its time in the, in the sun to talk, and I'll talk about um, its chemistry and how it reacts in soils. So give you an overview of what I'm going to say this morning. So it's a nutrient that's very important for us in agriculture and um, we can't grow crops um, and, and feed animals and feed the world without phosphorus. Um, it's got a finite um, uh, uh, lifespan and uh, it, it, you know, when we remove it from the ground, we need to replace it. So I'm going to talk about how that works and how we have to manage our soils to make sure that we're optimizing our pea. Uh, it's interaction with other things in soil because soil is a very complex medium. And then I'm going to talk about pinch points on the farm for losses because uh, this is a water quality seminar, a water quality series. So I'm going to uh, focus on that then in the second half and uh, the right, right measure in the right place. So what measure and where, um, we're gonna to touch on that. Okay, so in terms of uh, soils, soils, as I said earlier on, they're very complex, um, complex matrix, a complex medium, and every soil, uh, everywhere in the world, there's, so there's sand, silt, and clay. And they're the three kind of pillars of what keep the soil together in terms of structure and in terms of chemistry and also in terms of biology. You'll have organic matter there. I've drawn them in as grey clouds. And the organic matter serves the purpose of being the glue in the soil that holds everything together. And in between all of this, you'll have water and air. And that's very important for drainage. And it's also very important for um, making sure that nutrients are solubilized and they're in a soluble form in water so that the plant can uh, take a drink from the soil and, and take those nutrients up with it. So the orthophosphate ion that I have here on the left in the, in the big bubble, that's what we talk about when we talk about phosphorus. When we talk about phosphorus plant availability and when we talk about phosphorus in terms of water quality, we talk about the orthophosphate ion. So that's, that's it here. It's, it's not P on its own, but it's P attached to some oxygen and some hydrogen. And it also um, has a strong affinity for other things in the soil. But when you look at Water quality data from the EPA, they're talking about orthophosphate. And when we talk about um, phosphorus in soil, we are also talking about the, the 
ortho P that the plant can take up. But it's not as simple as one form of phosphorus. There are many forms. So uh, it can exist as an organic uh, form. So when plant material breaks down, uh, you get plant residues and they will have a certain amount of organic P in them. Uh, soil organic matter holds a lot of uh, organic P as well. And soil organic matter, we all know today now, is very important for storing carbon. So we like to keep our soil organic matter at a healthy level in, in our soils throughout the world because it's a good carbon store. But that organic P can get mineralized into an inorganic form. So an inorganic form is what we end up knowing as plant available P. And that's the bit that the plant can see. The plant can't really access some of the other forms, but it can access the plant available form. So unlike nitrogen, and you would have heard Carl Richards last week talk about a nitrogen cycle that would you know, uh, overwhelm you in terms of detail and the amount of transformations and reactions that happen with nitrogen. There's many different forms of nitrogen. There's denitrification reactions and nitrification reactions. And it also then exists as a gas and can be released to air. Phosphorus doesn't have a gaseous component. So it stays in the soil. It doesn't get released as a gas to air. So whatever happens, happens in the soil. So it either becomes soluble or insoluble. And that's really basically what I'm gonna talk about next. When we look at phosphorus in soil and we want to get an idea of how much is there, we have to extract it first. So unlike say the freshwater uh, uh, people who if they take a sample from a river or a stream, they can take a sample and bring it straight into a lab and analyze the phosphorus that's in solution in that water. So if it was a river or, or a lake or whatever, the phosphorus would already be solubilized and in, <coughs> excuse me, that freshwater sample. For soil, however, we have to pull it out first. So we have to take a soil sample, we have to extract that soil sample with a reagent, and that reagent is called Morgan's reagent in Ireland, but there are many other types of reagents out there that can do more or less the same thing. Then we bring our sample into the lab and we present it to this um, uh, machine, which is called our latchet analyzer, and uh, we take our extracts of soil uh, phosphorus and we run them through this machine with a series of reagents. The reagents turn, a, uh, turn the solution into a blue colour and we're able to read the concentration of phosphorus in solution from that. <coughs> and we have a link between soil test P and water quality so we kind of know that uh, what levels we should be at in terms of soil P. So what they might be um, for water quality we want to stay at index three or below. So in terms of minimizing the risk of P loss to water, index four is, means that your result has come back telling you that you're at an excessive level of P in soil. So the P index system is based on a number of things, but it's, it's based on the soil test that, you, that we carry out for the, for the soil sample that comes in. But it's also based on the stocking rate and the land use. And basically the P index system is there to inform you on how to manage that soil in terms of does your soil, is your soil deficient or low in phosphorus and in not in a, in a situation where you can supply enough P for plant uptake or crop uptake. So there's going to be a certain demand for P from crops and we want to make sure that we have enough there to feed the crops. So aiming for um, index three optimum uh, but as I said, there's other factors there, so uh, stocking rate and land use as well. But index four, from a water quality perspective, it means that there's too much plant available P in the system. Now, some of the things that we can do to improve our phosphorus availability would be to look at other parameters. So, um, well, you know, the soil test itself is, is very important, but other things like soil pH are equally important. So if you have a soil type, if you're in a part of the country like the map here, where you are uh, on a part of uh, the country that is mapped as an acid soil, you might have a low pH and that's just a naturally occurring thing. Um, uh, your soils might be prone to, to slipping down to pH of around five. And that means that you are reducing the solubility of phosphorus um, in the soil. <clears throat> so, by liming those soils and making sure that you optimize your pH, you correct your pH and you get your pH up to about 6.2, 6.3, you're also maximizing the chances of phosphorus being available and soluble 
which means that they're more likely to be uh, ready for plant uptake when the plant needs them. So those kind of soils, those ones I've just talked about, those acid ones, tend to be, have, a, have a lot of aluminium in them. So aluminium binds to phosphorus in a way that um, they're, you know, they're both, uh, they both have a high affinity for each other. But um, if, if you have a soil where there's a lot of aluminium in it, it might tend towards being acidic. And they're the soils you need to correct for pH. On the other side, you might be in a part of the country with a lot of calcium and you might be on a limestone parent material and there might be a lot of calcium in the soil um, uh, and the soil has a tendency to be, uh, have a high pH. These soils can also decrease your chances of, of uh, phosphorus solubility and availability. So you need to, knowing your soil um, will also help inform you in how to manage uh, your, your land. Okay, so I'm going to touch on um, some of the the terms we use in agriculture, like phosphorus buildup and phosphorus drawdown, um, will be very common to people who, who um, uh, are working in agronomy or working in agriculture. Um, but what this means uh, for a general audience out there who might understand this, is that we need to build up our phosphorus levels in soils to a certain amount. And when we have that amount uh, uh, built up, then the soil is able to supply phosphorus for plant uptake. So I've broken down the inorganic pea pool here into three boxes. The available pea box, and I put a value of 10 milligrams of, uh, milligrams of pea per kilogram of soil or milligrams per liter, depending on, on how you measure it, <coughs> into this box, because this, this is quite a, a, a small concentration relative to the, to the overall concentration of pea in the soil. And this available pea pool is the one that we have to control with fertilizer or control with crop offtake. So this is the one that the plant can access straight away. It's easy to extract in terms of testing, and, and that's the, 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 the available pea pool that we test with the Morgan's pea test, or the soil pea test, or whatever pea test you might be using in your part of the world. Um, the box beside it then, I, I call available reserves. So it's kind of like uh, money in the bank. It's phosphorus that's not immediately available, but can become available. And this is phosphorus that is bound to elements in soil, such as aluminium, iron, calcium, magnesium, copper, mangane man manganese, and potassium, depending on where you are in the world and what your soils are. Generally speaking in Ireland, so our Irish soils and um, phosphorus in our in soils have a strong affinity for aluminium, iron, and calcium. That's our experience of looking at the interaction with other elements in soils. The last box on the left is fixed P. So this means it's inaccessible. It's inaccessible unless you break down the soil sample and you digest it completely. So that's P associated with parent material or um, uh, decomposed kind of uh, or breaking down of bedrock uh, matter. So it's not immediately available. Uh, it's not available for plant uptake, but it, over time and over a very long time, it could possibly become um, available. But the important ones are the available P and the available reserves. So build up, how does that happen? Okay, so if we're, if we're working with a system where we're removing phosphorus in either grass, meat, milk, silage, we need to replace it with an input of P. And that has to go back into the available P box so that the, when the crop needs more P, it has access to it straight away. And that's a fast reaction. When, Fertilizer granules or, or slurry is added to ground. It's very soluble. <clears throat> so it's a very fast reaction. It can go straight into that available pea pool. Some of the um, pea that is not needed right now can go into the pea reserves. And that's a fast reaction followed by a slow reaction. And you'll notice that I have arrows going both ways, which means that these reactions can happen um, back and forth. So when the available pea pool is completely depleted, the pea reserves kick in and they start to supply more pea into the available pea pool. But in order for um, the crop to have enough phosphorus to um, take up, there has to be a certain buildup. So buildup means if you have a phosphorus deficient or a low pea soil, that available pea pool will be very, very small. And the reserves are also very small. So buildup means that we're trying to build up to a certain threshold value or optimum value so that the soil can then supply P for plant uptake. But the very important thing here is to check your pH. If you find that buildup isn't happening, 
or you're not getting a response to phosphorus that you put out because you're, you're trying to build up, but you're testing your soils and you're not seeing that shift in index or shift in Morgan's p-value. Check the pH because the pH could be um, not optimum. It could be a little bit acidic and it, could, it might mean that um, you need to correct that first and then go at your phosphorus. So in terms of drawdown, or sorry, I'm still on buildup. Uh, what happens when we add P to soil? So this is where we're looking at different soil types and how they might respond differently to build up because you know, um, not all soils are the same. They all uh, react differently to phosphorus. So I have a picture of Connect4 here on my screen to remind me to tell you that adding phosphorus to soil is a, is a bit like filling up the slots in a Connect4. And the slots are basically the, the clay uh, minerals such as aluminium, iron and calcium that I mentioned earlier that will hold on to phosphorus. Now, if you have a soil that's very high in aluminium and, there's, and you have a large connect four, you have a lot of slots to fill and you have a very tightly bound aluminium and phosphorus ion or phosphorus ion compound. So they, they are chemically bound quite tightly. And the top arrow here, if I can just point at them here, are my high P fixing soils. So you need to add a lot to get to optimum. In the other soils, you need to add a certain amount, a, a, a lot less, and you'll get to optimum. And then on the other side of the coin, these soils here have a very poor capacity to absorb and retain P. So you only need to add very little and you're already at optimum, which means that you're adding a very small amount of P and it's in the available P pool ready to go. These guys are the high organic matter soils, okay? But back to the high P fixers, be patient with these soils because it could take time to build up to where you want to be. Um, and so it might happen a lot quicker on other soils around the farm or around uh, um, uh, if you've got a number of different uh, soil types on your farm, you might see differences even though both are getting the same amounts. Um, you might see a quick response to one but a very, very slow response to another. Okay, so <clears throat> the other side to build up is drawdown. So this is when we want to um, release P from those available reserves. Um, and it's, it's basically um, drawdown will happen uh, is when, when we want to decline from index three down to, in, or sorry, from index four down to index three. Again, this is gonna depend on the soil. So if you have um, my connect four box over here, if you have a, a soil with a lot of aluminium, a lot of absorption sites, a heavy clay soil, for example, um, it's going to take time for that to draw down or, or decline down from index four to index three. So again, this graph over here is just uh, um, my way of showing you that if you have a high aluminium to phosphorus ratio in soils, in other words, a lot of aluminium, a lot of, a lot of sites for phosphorus to um, bind onto, and it's quite tightly bound, you need to bring that down and until you reach that optimum. So what happens in terms of how can we visualize this happening in the soil? So we can imagine that clay is like sheets of paper um, in the soil. These are my purple, purple sheets of paper here and they have sites or little poles or placeholders for phosphorus or for any other nutrient. It can, it's not, not only phosphorus, it can be any nutrient or trace element. And this is why texture is important. So if, for heavy clay soils, there'll be a lot of clay, which means there'll be a lot of sites. And uh, there should be a lot of elements like aluminium, iron, calcium, depending on the type of uh, the soil type and the, and the type of clay that's there. And the organic matter is the clouds that, that kind of, as I said earlier on, the glue that holds it all together. But often uh, to uh, organic matter can be too much of a good thing in terms of phosphorus. So we have our clay layers here with some phosphorus already uh, um, bound on. And um, if we have a high organic matter soil, and my definition of that is, is where you have more than 20% organic matter in the top 10 centimeters of a soil profile, um, you're going to block off some of those absorption sites, some of those placeholders where phosphorus would, would like to go when it comes into the system. So I now add my phosphorus to soil and it has nowhere to bind or nowhere to absorb to. So now I have a scenario where my, the phosphorus I've just added to this soil is staying in solution. So it's staying in a form where it's now soluble. 
because it cannot physical chemically bind to the soil matrix via the clay, um, the clay layers in, in the soil because these are occluded or blocked by organic matter. So soil is naturally high in organic matter. There's a high risk of P loss from these soils, P loss to water, if, if the phosphorus added is not taken up by the plant. So the concept of buildup doesn't apply here. We can't build up these soils. So the phosphorus index is not relevant on high organic matter soils. And it's some of these soils, and I'll, I'll talk about them later, they're, they're known as um, peaty soils or peaty mineral soils or organo mineral soils. But essentially, it all boils down to how much organic matter is in the top 10 centimeters. And if you have a soil tested for organic matter and the value comes back at greater than 20 centimeters, you have to default to a maintenance only um, rate of P so that you're only supplying P that the crop needs. And you're doing it at a time when there is a demand for P. Otherwise, you'll put P into the system. And then if uh, you, you can't assume that the soil will be able to hold on to it and keep it there until the crop needs it. And the, so the timing is, is very important on these soils. So here's some of these soils that I've just been talking about here. Now, a, a soil surveyor's definition of a peat would be something that has greater than 20 or 30 percent organic matter right down to 40 centimeters in the profile. But we do have a lot of these transitional soils. So they're soils that they're, they're not peat by definition and they're not mineral by definition, they're somewhere in between. So the histic humic words there refer to that organic topsoil that sits on top of them. And they often have a, have a, mineral, um, a mineral layer underneath them. So these are the ones that we have to be very careful about in terms of um, managing phosphorus on those soils so that we minimize the, the losses to water. So knowing the soil is very important. And some of the work that we're doing in Johnstown um, is trying to help us build information about uh, local knowledge of our soils. So we, we have a lot of data existing about the soil information system that tells you the soil type in your area. There's also the national um, the geochemical database um, which tells you uh, what's the geochemistry um, around the country. Um, but there's been advances in getting that information to scales that's a little bit more important and, and a little bit more relevant for management. So the Geological Survey of Ireland have the TELUS survey, which is ongoing at the moment, which is um, collecting samples at, at a fine spatial re resolution and doing a geochemical survey on them and also collect, uh, measuring organic matter and pH. And we're working with the, the GSI on this on a project called TerraSoil, where we're taking those samples from them and also adding available P information. So Morgan's P and then what's in reserve then in terms of what's in that reserve box, what's in the bank, um, and what's the aluminium, iron, and calcium levels. So that'll help us to build our local knowledge of soils. Okay, so in terms of landscape um, and diffuse losses of pea, um, I've talked about how it sits within the soil system and, and what the risks are in terms of losses. But when we move from um, inside the soil matrix out into the wider environment, we now have to think about the transport vector. And Phosphorus is an element or uh, a, a, the orthophosphate compound. It's very soluble and very mobile. So if there's water around and the water is moving, it will hop on and move with it. So we need to be very careful about looking at uh, phosphorus in terms of the transport, the potential for it to move in terms of transport. And poorly drained soils get a really bad rap here in terms phosph for phosphorus loss. Um, they tend to be very flashy catchments, by which we mean if there's a, a heavy rainfall event, the response from the soils in that catchment is to produce a lot of overland flow and, you, and there's a lot of water coming through. So you can be guaranteed there's probably phosphorus with it if there's a source there. And Jenny Deacon would have talked about the decline in river water quality um, from recent reports. So um, it is very important that we manage phosphorus quite carefully. But why is P loss a poorly drained soils issue? Why isn't it a well-drained soils issue? So Carl Richards last week talked about nitrogen being a well-drained soils issue because nitrogen can move down the soil profile and into groundwater. But phosphorus is a little different. It doesn't tend to move right down through the soil profile, but there's, always, there's an exception to every rule, of course, and there are some incidents where that happens. But by and large, phosphorus is 
it hangs around in the surface of the soil. And this is where you have some of those surface pathways like overland flow and, and runoff. And when you have a volume of water moving through land and there's a concentration of phosphorus in the soil solution, that will move with it. So poorly drained soils are those soils where the response to rainfall is to produce a lot of pathway. And uh, when we talk about, in agronomy, we're, we're, we're used to talking about uh, phosphorus balances. So we like to think in terms of a mass balance of the phosphorus we put into the system and the phosphorus that the crops offtake or that we remove from the system. Well, that's very similar to how we think about phosphorus at catchment scale. We talk about phosphorus load. And uh, so we can express loss to water as a load of phosphorus in a kilogram of P per hectare per year. And that gives us a mass loss or load of P that has left uh, a catchment or left a hydrological area that has drained to a point. So this is a function of that ortho P concentration in, in solution and the flow or the volume. So the more water you have flushing through the system, it'll bring more phosphorus with it. And you can see here, and this is Jenny Deacon's slide from, from the fifth of uh, the month in, in this series, the concentrations of ortho P in those um, uh, poorly drained catchments is higher than uh, those catchments with, without a phosphorus issue. So uh, that's, that's phosphorus uh, on poorly drained soils. So if we move now to um, uh, farm scale, so uh, we're going to talk about farms on poorly drained soils and what we might do here to mitigate losses of pea from, from the soils. So what are the critical source areas or pinch points for pea at farm scale? Um, critical source areas by definition are an area of the landscape where a source coincides with a transport vector. So that could be a source of pea coinciding with a pathway um, or a mobilization that's, that's going to be moving some of that nutrient off. Uh, end into water. Um, so here are some examples of pathways at farm scale. So when we talk about overland flow, we are talking about saturation ex excess and areas of the farm where there's likely to be ponding or likely to be water logging. So these are the poorly drained soils. Um, how to spot these is, is fairly uh, straightforward. You go out in the winter and walk around and you can feel the, the, the saturation excess at the surface of the ground and you, there's often indicator vegetation there as well to, to in, that indicates to you if there's a preponderance of rushes in, in, the, in the field, this is a particularly wet field. Um, another uh, pathway um, for um, water um, on the farm are springs and ditches and drains. So a lot of farms have ditches and drains, which I'll talk about now in a second. And uh, they serve to move water away from land to try and, and promote more a more drier um, environment for grass to grow. Um, and these can be subsurface underneath, uh, within the field, and they can be surface open ditches. So they're usually at the side of the field where, you can, where the field boundary is. And these can often link up and uh, create a sort of a network of connectivity around the farm. So uh, another form of another transport vector on the farm might be roads and yards. So if you have concrete areas and a lot of rainfall um, and very little infiltration or percolation in terms of the soils around it, you might get um, uh, runoff from roads and yards. And look out for Owen Fenton's webinar in July in this series. He's going to talk about soil hydrology. So he'll deal with a lot of the um, uh, aspects there. And uh, the Roadrunner project, if you, can, if you want to follow his updates on Twitter, will give you an idea of what we're doing on roads there. So the connectivity is, is, is a word that I like to use, uh, describes for me how, how some of the pathways can link up. So uh, I mentioned ditches and drains earlier on. Um, they come in all forms and shapes and sizes. We have ditches that are uh, in the field. They just kind of cut through the middle of the field. We have ditches that are boundary ditches and they usually um, form a perimeter around the field. And then we have ditches, the, the bottom one here, where uh, a number of ditches might all meet up um, and, and form an outlet or an outflow and leave the farm. And uh, so uh, the connectivity to streams and outlets is largely around where on the farm some of these ditches might be taking some um, nutrients with it. 
So we have some ditches um, that are linked directly to a stream and some ditches were, were, as I said earlier on, they're all coming together at a point on the farm and then they could be leaving the farm to a neighboring, to neighboring land or they could be going off to a culvert or going off to a stream. So just, these are just some of the examples of the types of connectivity vectors. So on a map here, you can see that we have classified our ditches based on what they're connected to, um, what their um, uh, connectivity is around the farm and what they might be bringing with them. So um, the purple ditches are the outlets. So these are ditches that are by the side of the field, but they're draining directly into a, a water body. So a stream here, in this example here, our farm sits right, uh, uh, straddles a, a river here. And some of the fields that have ditches, boundary ditches on the side are draining straight into this stream here. The yellow ditches are what we call secondary ditches. So they're just linking up um, uh, main ditches. And uh, we have uh, come across a lot of disconnected ditches. So can, ditches that are not connected to a water body, they don't seem to be connected to the, to the main network either. They're sort of just sitting there um, in the, uh, either as a boundary uh, ditch or, or possibly sometimes an infield ditch. And they're sort of, they're like a storage tank for water um, as it rises up and down. And then we have ditches that, that can also receive runoff from concrete areas like yards and roads. And they're usually positioned quite close to the farmyard. And these are the ones that we have to be very careful about because from some of the work we've done collecting water samples from ditches, we've noticed that we'll see high phosphorus concentrations in the ditch water running through the ditch if there's a yard nearby and there's some runoff um, being received into, the, into that ditch. So this is an example of a length of ditch here and we were able to capture the, the point in that ditch where um, there's some influence of the yard. Now also in a ditch, at the bottom of a ditch there's sediment and the sediment can also act, it can, it can go two ways, it can either act to retain phosphorus if, if that ditch doesn't, doesn't receive um, too many nutrients over a long period of time. But in this case here, it's a sediment that has accumulated phosphorus. So again, it's the same, um, the same scenario here. There's an influence, it's very close to the yard and very close to that, to that um, area where there's a lot of runoff from concrete areas and roads. There's a bit of phosphorus accumulating in the sediment and that then over time can release phosphorus into the ditch water. For more on sediment, you might catch uh, Dara O'Hulikon's uh, webinar also in July in this series, and he'll touch on sediment as a pressure um, uh, in water quality. So when we bring it all together, we try and describe the pinch points for phosphorus in the farm. So we talked about the source in terms of uh, fields, uh, if they're in index four and if they've been receiving XSP. Another source might be um, uh, proximity to concrete areas, runoff from yards and roads. Pathways can be uh, surface overland flow on wet areas. Connectivity can be uh, ditches and drains that kind of drain a whole area around a farm. And then if there's a stream nearby, you've got a receptor. So how can we find a pinch point on a farm? So for the catchment scientists out there or anybody working in the local authorities, water protection, or the Agricultural Sustainability Service, um, the ASAP um, advisors. You might look at this farm and tell me, what P measure would you put on this farm and where would you put it? So this is a farm on a glay soil, so it's a poorly drained uh, soil. Um, the farmer has put in some uh, infield drains here. So the field boundaries are all marked up. Where I have blue, we've, we've mapped wet fields, okay? So these are all the fields that we walked over the winter time and found them to be either uh, very saturated and very wet. Um, the ones, twos, threes and fours refer to the phosphorus index. So one and two means uh, deficient and low in P. Three means they've got it just about right. So you're at optimum for P here. And four means uh, there's an excessive amount of P in this field, okay? So the river runs through this farm here. And the arrows refer to the slope of the land. So the slope of the land means that it's sloping down towards the river towards the arrow. And this is probably very typical of a riparian area where you have lowland sloping down towards the river. 
So you can um, see that to help you make your decision in terms of what measure, where the pinch point might be and what measure you might put on this farm, um, I'm going to give you a heads up that the water quality samples we collected were, were okay around here. We didn't see uh, any problem. When I say water quality, I mean phosphorus in the ditches and drains that we collected. Not necessarily, we didn't um, uh, look at the water quality in the river per se. So it's water uh, phosphorus concentrations on the farm that we're using to try and guide us or inform us on where the pinch point might be. So up here was, was all okay. Um, the, uh, nothing breached the, the EQS, which is the quality standard for P. And around here was fine too. Um, and around here it wasn't too bad either but we found high concentrations of pea in the ditches coming around here. Um, and uh, so anything that was feeding into this part of the, the stream here. <clears throat> so for me, for my money, the pinch point is around here. We have an index four soil, uh, uh, a slightly upstream or uphill uh, with a slope down towards a river. And uh, we have two ditches on either side of it which um, are getting some influence of the yards above it. So I don't know if your measures are the same as mine, but my first measure would be to um, correct the nutrient management planning on the farm. So uh, maybe some of the P going out on the index four could go to the index ones and twos. And this is an example here of uh, not a critical source area, even though there might be a pathway, the source is low. So, um, as I said earlier on, a pinch point or a critical source area, we have to have those two factors there to make it um, a pinch point. Then the other thing I would do would just make sure that um, we're, we reduce any runoff losses from the yard. And another possible measure might be to widen the ditch. Maybe widen the ditch and expose more clay sites for phosphorus absorption. Um, that might be the third measure you put in. So I'm uh, interested to see what some of the catchment scientists said there think. Uh, if you've got anything different to what I've suggested or you think the pinch point might be somewhere else. So here's another case study. So <clears throat> let you look at that for a second. It's another poorly drained soil, another clay farm, uh, clay soil with the river up here, but everything uh, more or less sloping down this direction. So the farmyard is at the top of the hill and uh, uh, the slope the direction of the slope of the land is, is towards the river. So again, the blue fields are wet fields that we noted uh, over the winter. And uh, so we've been back and forth to these farms over the past uh, 18 months. Down here, there was a lot of indicator vegetation. So this is uh, even wetter than the fields above it. So, and that makes sense, I guess, if you're on a hill slope and you have wet ground above, then the wet then the ground right towards the river is, is probably going to be receiving the lion's share of water coming down that, that hill slope. And there's also arrows pointing in this direction here, which tell us that the slope of the land is also heading towards this point here. <clears throat> in terms of um, connectivity, and um, there's a number of ditches um, uh, connected up and a, num a, a small number of infield drains here. Um, in terms of sources, there's a number of uh, index four fields here. There's three of them in a row here. So high soil P on wet ground, all sloping uh, down towards this direction here and a wet field over here, sloping down towards here. Uh, um, the water quality in terms of the phosphorus concentrations in the ditches, um, not so much the water quality in the river, but so uh, just caveat here is that it's in the ditch. I'm not talking about uh, pea concentrations in the rivers. Hey, Karen, but I, everything, time is uh, catching up on us here. Now, okay. so if you could... Uh, uh, I'll wrap up shortly. Wrap up shortly, thanks. Um, so over here, in terms of where we found the highest concentrations in the ditches was down here at this point. So my pinch point for my money is down here. I'm not sure what you think... Um, a uh, measure might be, but the first thing again is to correct for nutrient management planning. There's a lot, uh, there's a few uh, index ones that could take an index two that could take more P and maybe alleviate the source pressure on the index fours. Um, is a riparian buffer something that we might do in this area here, um, given that we have a lot of water coming down here, 
uh, would we widen the ditch again uh, um, along here and maybe expose a bit more sorption sites for phosphorus and, and obviously then looking at making sure that the yard is, is well sealed is, is, is another one. An example of some of the measures that I'm talking about here, um, an in-ditch measure here, uh, this, this photograph came from Fran Igo from the Allo catchment where they put in a sediment trap to try and drop out the sediment. Um, and a more engineered solution might be to drop out the sediment and then put in some kind of filter or media that would mop up phosphorus um, like alum um, or uh, they, they, there's a lot of different uh, media that you can use to mop up nitrogen and phosphorus and then you have water coming out the other side. So you're slowing down the flow, but you're also cleaning it up at the other side. Uh, and the sediment trap on its own, it will serve to slow down the flow as well. So these are some of the in-ditch measures. Some of the field measures might be uh, riparian um, uh, buffer strips and uh, field uh, buffer strips, just to try and uh, bring the source back a, a bit from the, the river. So the take home messages really from this are to know your soil when it comes to phosphorus. Um, pH, if you get that right, you might find that you're in, improving the availability of P, um, among other things. If you have a high organic matter soil, um, you have to be very prudent with your phosphorus use. Um, you might find that some soils um, might be slow to respond to build up and drawdown. <clears throat> and when it comes to water quality, identifying the pinch points on the farm, you need to just think about ditches, drains, uh, where the sources are, what's connected to it and try and manage or try and uh, mitigate any losses by making sure that you have a lot of those measures that we talk about to um, uh, an even distribution of phosphorus around the farm, avoid those index fours, um, seal any leaks from the yard, um, will a buffer strip work if you, if you have wet areas or, or if you have land that could be um, moved into a buffer strip that's near a riparian zone, and ditches. Ditches might provide a solution, a sort of a, a, an easy solution um, to put a, a measure inside a ditch. It doesn't take any land out of production and it could solve a problem too. So I'll just say thank you for listening everyone and uh, looking forward to your feedback and questions. Thank you, Karen. That was excellent <laughs> overview of the, the science uh, behind uh, phosphorus and water quality. And uh, I, I think we didn't go too heavy hard on us with the, the graph, so yeah. thanks for that. Uh, lots of questions coming through here, and um, so do keep them coming through. Just while you're catching your breath there, Carol, I just want yeah. to, to be, uh, let people know about a, a webinar that's uh, coming up next, uh, next Tuesday morning. It relates to the sustainability of Irish agriculture. Uh, Dr. Connor Cahill O'Donoghue We'll be speaking about the latest uh, sustainability uh, assessment for Irish agriculture covering economic, social and environmental metrics. So that takes place next Tuesday morning uh, between 9.30 and 10.30. So uh, do, do join us for, for that. Uh, and you can just register through the, the Chagas website. Uh, so, uh, Andy, a few uh, good questions coming through there for, for Karen. Um, loads, of, loads of questions, uh, Mark. Um, Karen, uh, a couple of fairly technical ones. Um, the first one really, um, and then maybe there's a couple on this, in, in relation to research um, for P loss to waters, it, uh, and it's, is it determined more by hydrogeological factors uh, than P availability in the soil? Well, um, it's both. Uh, I, I think that, um uh, we've established and the EPA have established with their um, risk assessment maps and their diffuse tools maps and um, the research that they've carried out and the research that we've carried out in the catchments program that it's very much a uh, poorly drained soils uh, issue so that is soil hydrology that's the driver there and um, you do need a source uh, to lose you know if uh, if there isn't a source there and mm -hmm. um, you know uh, losses come from a particular source so the catchments program have shown that uh, catchments that are well drained um, have lower losses or loads of P than catchments that are poorly drained. And the EPA have shown this as well, with their sub catchments and their PIPS maps too. But so if we were to sort of weight one over the other, you could probably say that the soil hydrology definitely is, is, uh, carries more weight 
um, or a, a bigger influence on phosphorus losses to a catchment scale than the available pea pool in the soil. And, and another one, um, Karen, on the pea uh, that is bound to iron, we we'll say aluminium and calcium, um, under, under what conditions is that released back into available pea or how does it transform back into available pea? Is it pH related or you know, what other conditions? Can you say sure. to that? <clears throat> so I, I, earlier on, at the top of the talk, I, 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 I showed people the different pools of phosphorus in soil. So, so the iron, aluminium and calcium are all uh, situated within the clays in the soil. So uh, that's where we have a reserve of pea. So that's the phosphorus in the bank, if you like. So when we have phosphorus and we add it to, to uh, soil, the aluminium and the calcium and iron have a strong affinity for this element. So they'll mop it up and they'll hold it in reserve. And then as the uh, plant removes phosphorus um, for crop uptake or whatever, that available pea pool is depleted. So that concentration reduces. And then this, the, the uh, uh, reserves can then release more pea into the soil solution. It's a combination of chemistry and biology. So the roots will, uh, will often um, uh, solubilize more phosphorus. So the bacteria in the soil can make phosphorus more soluble. So it all, there's chemistry and the biology works together to try and get some of that phosphorus in the bank back out into um, solution. And it's like, and the chemistry part of it is the concentration gradient. So if you, if you have a, if you see a drop in concentration in one pea pool, then the other pea pool will respond to that concentration drop and try and put more phosphorus into the system to get the concentration back up again. One other there, um, Karen, on the pinch points, uh, someone is wondering how useful would technology such as LIDAR be in identifying those areas, you know, that could be a source or a pathway or a problem? Right. Yeah, so, so LIDAR, as, as I understand it, is quite useful at, at looking for areas in the land that where water is. Um, I'm not sure that they can pick up um, ditches quite to the detail that we, we've done. So the, some of the maps that, we, uh, that I showed you there earlier on, with the, my different ditch categories and um, where we've spotted ditches that were all linked up and, and coming together to form an outlet or an outflow that was leaving the farm either to neighboring land or to a stream. I'm not sure that LIDAR would pick that up. And, because, and that's a very specific point on the farm. So LIDAR might show you where you'll see a pathway in terms of uh, overland flow or, or runoff, and it might show you um, some, some of the ditches, but the connectivity is something that you need to figure out for yourself by walking around, and that's what we did. We walked around 10 farms, we mapped all of the ditches around those farms, and then we started to layer up other information like the source, the P index, the slope of the land, where it's all draining into. Um, so I'm not an expert in LIDAR, and maybe somebody out there might be able to, to correct me on this, but to my knowledge, I'm not sure that it can get quite down to the level of detail that I showed there. Just while you mentioned ditches, we just had one come in on widening ditches as mm. a pea reduction measure. Will the extra exposed clay eventually get saturated? I guess over time, that's probably what might happen. So um, there is, uh, I'm not sure if it's in, in practice or just in the literature, but there is some, um, some suggestions that you might um, uh, excavate or scrape off the, the layer of sediment in the bottom of the ditch and uh, put that up on the field. And then you expose a, a sediment layer that's a nice a fresh one that has um, a few more absorption sites for, for fossils to, to go on to. Um, and the same <clears throat> concept applies to widening the ditch. If you bring the bank side of the ditch out a bit, um, you are exposing more clays and more minerals to phosphorus absorption. Um, but I guess I, I can't answer the question in terms of how long would that take to build up um, to a level where you would have to maybe uh, do it again. I don't know. These are just uh, ideas uh, uh, that, that might be able to mitigate um, pea loss if you can't fix the problem um, upstream of the ditch um, because ditches might offer a, 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 an opportunity for, for putting a measure in. Um, so widening the ditches is, is one solution, but I suppose 
the more technical solutions that I mentioned there of putting a filter media into the ditch. So you're, you're trapping the sediment and then you're letting the water through and it's going through um, a, a sand bag or, or, or a bag that's filled with a media that can mop up phosphorus. And then when that's been completely saturated with phosphorus, you can lift that out of the ditch and replace it with something else. So that could be a solution too. And, and one other, other comment, Mark, just on ditches, um, someone suggested, um, uh, what's your uh, take, Karen, on planting native trees above ditch line as opposed to widening ditches, which pinch yeah. which, which yeah. you know. Mark, could be a some more there that you want to go through? Yeah, well, with that, that particular one now, I think is quite interesting because I know uh, talking to our forestry colleagues that there is a, I believe there is a scheme being developed at the moment to support farmers in planting uh, riparian zones there in order to, you know, to provide a, a landscape level solution to phosphorus loss. Um, but I know there have been issues uh, with uh, phosphorus accumulation in these riparian zones over the years. Uh, is that a real concern, Karen? Yeah, I, there's some evidence coming into the literature now where um, if you have, uh, and I, I'm not sure if it's, it's, if it's specifically for phosphorus, or sorry, for, for forestry related uh, riparian areas, but saturated buffers where you find an area that's, com that's um, constantly saturated you might end up creating what we call um, anoxic conditions or conditions where there's not much oxygen around. And that can actually cause a bit of uh, release of pee from the, the soil profile as well. You know, it's kind of like a, an unfortunate side effect of, of a buffer that's, const that's always wet. <clears throat> if the chemistry in there lends itself to releasing a form of phosphorus that's very soluble under very, very wet conditions, um, it can it can counter what you're trying to do in the first place. So putting the I right should, buffer should, in the right place is, is, I, is very, very important. Yeah, I should um, clarify that it is a separate issue really to the, the, the planting of, <coughs> of trees, um, not, not to be confused. Um, a question here in relation to zinc uh, uh, phosphorus ratio. Um, hmm. Is this important for the availability of P? I haven't come across zinc as being a, um, a driver of P availability in Irish soils, but that's not to say that it doesn't have an affinity for P. Phosphorus is one of those elements that can, can um, have an affinity for a lot of different metals in, in soil. Um, zinc can be tied up with organic matter, I think. So there could be um, an interaction there between phosphorus and zinc on, on organic matter. Um, but in terms of the elements, we've found the strongest relationships for Irish soils, for our soils at least, the three main elements that, 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 that have the strongest correlations and relations are the aluminium, iron and calcium. Of course, the, the pH you mentioned in your, your graph earlier on, I presume <coughs> liming is a, a really important yeah. uh, management tool there in the, make, the release of, of uh, or making phosphorus available to the plant. Yeah, and pH, you know, it's, it's, if you were to do one thing, as David Wall often says, correct the pH, because it not only corrects the chemistry and makes nutrients and trace elements more soluble, it creates that neutral environment where, where a lot of um, um, uh, nutrients, major nutrients and, and trace elements um, uh, are at, it, at their best, they're at their most soluble form. But it also helps the biology. So um, a lot of the soil uh, microbiota uh, likes to be at, at a certain pH. So it helps both the biology and the chemistry too. We're getting quite a few questions in relation to measures to, uh, I suppose, improve phosphorus retention and co-benefits for, benefits for biodiversity. So what we might do is to uh, hold some of those questions for our uh, next week's uh, speakers, uh, David Wall and Mark Plunkett, who will be talking about the actual practical measures that farmers can undertake yeah, to, yeah. to to do that. But um, we've got think, a few questions. Sorry, Mark, as well yeah. around the whole area of Morgan's P test and its suitability in Ireland and different types oh. of style type and that. Karen, mm. would you have? I mean, I know this is a, <laughs> yeah. a well tried argument and tested argument, but I mean, you might have some comment to make on that. Okay, so, so like, like I mentioned, <coughs> um, the pH is the first thing. So if you do find that, 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 that you're trying to build up on a particular part of the farm or a particular fields, and you're not seeing a shift in the Morgan's P value, um, 
obviously the pH um, could, be an, it could be a factor there, but assuming that you've corrected the pH and you're still not seeing a shift, then it could be that you have uh, you know, one of those high P fixing soils. And it's not that the test isn't working, it's just that they take time to build up. So um, the test might, might just be slow to respond because the soil is trying to work at building, building up to that optimum value. On the other side, there are some confounding issues with, with all tests and no soil p-test is universal. You know, I mean, in the, in the north of Ireland and in the UK, they use Olsen's p mm. and that causes problems with some particular soil types. And in the States, they use Malik p and, and that causes problems with some particular soil types. And here we use Morgan's p and we've spotted that on, on, on a small number of really high calcium soils, you might see a value that doesn't really reflect the management. And so maybe an alternative test. And, you know, there are some labs that will run Olsen's P for you or run Malik P for you if you think that, or if you know, for example, that uh, you've got a very high calcium soil, you can often get a value of Morgan's P that looks a lot higher than it should be. And that could be because the Morgan's reagent is actually extracting out some of that fixed calcium bound P when, which, which technically shouldn't really be available. And so that's one confounding factor that we've spotted. But, um, but you're talking about soils that are up in pH 7.5 and higher, up at 7.5 and 8, which is not the norm. Most of our soils sit in around 5.5 to 6.5. So um, it, it is the exception rather than the norm in terms of those soils. And so the, if your pH is very high, that could be um, a confounding factor. If you think that the Morgan's p-test is coming back a little higher than it should be, you might try a different test because some labs will do a different test for you. Question here well, in relation to the, the nitrates regulations. Um, Karen saying here that given that soil hydrology uh, is, is more important or heavily weighted, uh, yeah. Uh, than soil P reserves. Uh, do you think that the nitrates regulations uh, are effective in controlling P loss to water, given that the regs take very little regard of hydrology? Or, yeah. Uh, flipping that question, maybe is there an opportunity there to uh, to, to 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 look at measures that are more yeah. focused on on uh, addressing hydrology issues? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a blunt instrument. You know, it, it assumes that every area is the same, that a P index on, on one soil will behave the same as P index on every soil, regardless of the drainage or the hydrology. So there's scope there to kind of refine that a bit more and make the measures a bit more uh, uh, soil specific, if you like, you know. Um, but yeah, it is, it, is, it is a fairly crude instrument, but we have enough information now to tell us that we can tailor measures to soil types. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and th there was a project I was involved with a few years ago, the Irish Soil <laughs> Information System, which went went about mapping the whole the soils of Ireland. Um, I, I understand that the resolution isn't quite down to a farm level, but I mean, do you see a point where we will have uh, mapping and, and data sets available to to farmers and advisors to be able to make yeah. decisions at, at that level? I do. I think I think we're 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 coming to a stage where we can improve our local knowledge of soils. So the soil information system gives us an idea of how um, how we might describe soils in a particular area. Um, and yeah, the spatial resolution is not at farm scale, but it does tell you something about the soils in a particular area. So like previously, we would have had some of the county by county maps from the National Soil Survey. Um, that got down to quite a, a good level of detail. Mm -hmm. um, and there would have been drainage information in those as well. Um, but projects like TerraSoil and the TELUS survey that the geological GSI are running are going to give us information on a, on, on a, uh, that's at a higher spatial resolution and that's a little bit more, more relevant to managing nutrients. So typical soil survey maps might describe uh, um, uh, a grey brown podzolic, uh, which doesn't mean a whole lot in terms of phosphorus or phosphorus management, but um, some of the information that we're trying to bring on board with the TerraSoil project and the TELUS survey is to try and, and tell people locally this is an area with um, a naturally high aluminium or naturally high calcium 
or high organic matter soils and the drainage in these soils and the texture and, and, and drainage properties might be, um, so, you know, whatever. So we are trying to, we're, we're, we're all the time trying to build our knowledge base so that we can improve local knowledge of soils to make better decisions really. We're, we're out of time, I'm afraid, okay. Karen. Um, we, could, we could talk for another hour or so easily, I'm sure. Uh, look, thank you so much for your, your presentation. Excellent uh, uh, and really well explained. Uh, some really difficult concepts to uh, sure. sometimes to, to, to impart. So uh, well, well done on that. And uh, thanks to Andy Boland for assisting with the, the questions today. We unfortunately didn't get through all of the questions. Andy, I know there's with a lot of interest in this particular topic. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully we can carry a few over, the, over to next week. Uh, do join us next week uh, where we'll be looking at uh, water quality, optimizing nitrogen and phosphorus use uh, and farming practices to minimize uh, loss, loss to water. Uh, so I'll be joined by David Wall and Mark Plunkett. Um, so just after today's uh, webinar, you'll be asked to complete a short survey. Uh, we would uh, appreciate any feedback you have on, on the webinar series. And indeed, if you have any ideas or suggestions for future webinars, please include them in that, or you can email us at connected at chagas.ie. Uh, finally, I want to thank our production team, in particular, Noel Meehan, uh, who's organized this water quality element of our series, uh, Pat Murphy and Yvonne Maher also. So uh, from all the team, take care and stay safe, and we will hopefully see you uh, next week. Thank you. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.